My name is Maria Spiridonova. I'm 21 years old and a member of the Socialist Revolutionary Party. In the villages around me in Tambov, the Tsar's soldiers terrorised the peasants. They burned down their homes and destroyed their granaries to starve those who survived their slaughter. Something has to be done. I have spent the last week looking for the man responsible. General Gavrin Luzhinovsky. The Socialist Revolutionary Party in Tambov has an urgent message for him, and I have elected to deliver it. Luzhinovsky! Luzhinovsky, and I want to explain my motives. I am a member of the Socialist Revolutionary Party, and my deeds proceed from the ideas my party and I believe in, and the conditions that Russian life imposes on their realisation. The discontent of the people with the present regime has taken on the definite and threatening form of revolution, that is, armed resistance to the power of the state attempts on the lives of state officials and open fighting in the streets with the armed forces of the government. The state tried the usual forms of silencing the people, bullets, bayonets and guns, but they were not enough, so next they proclaimed a manifesto of liberty. But this was obviously just a clever tactical move and nothing more. Coinciding with this manifesto came reactionary pogroms the atrocities committed by the reaction worse than anything that had gone before. In less than three months, 200 men were condemned to death and executed. The rebels were thrown into prison. Opposition clubs were forbidden and the press was gagged. A clever spy system was set up to paralyse the activities of opposition clubs and armed risings were suppressed. The bureaucracy made it impossible for the dissatisfaction of the people to reach the head of state. They managed to create the impression that the country had reached a high state of well-being. What this bureaucracy did to suppress peasant uprisings was particularly violent. But I will consider only one district and its bloodthirsty hangman, Luzhinovsky. The trophies he brought home from his actions in more than 18 villages were murdered peasants, ruined farms, raped women and beaten children. He would talk as if peasants had no human value. The Tambov Committee of the Socialist Revolutionary Party recognised in him the embodiment of evil, despotism and violence, the typical expressions of autocracy. He was an oppressor of the people and there was no way of restraining him other than his death. So we made it our duty to defend the working masses, their happiness and their honour. Our party aims at the creation of such political and economic actions as will enable the people to march forward freely towards socialism, towards planned organisation of common labour for the common good, to a social order in which equality and liberty will become reality. 
in the name of humanity, in regard for human personality, truth and justice, the Tambov Committee and I pronounced sentence of death on Luzhinovsky. I undertook to carry out that death sentence in full knowledge of the consequences of my decision. For it would have broken my heart. It would have been an unbearable shame to go on living after the terror and demoralisation which reigned in the souls of the peasants after Luzhinovsky's maltreatment. After what he had done, there was no power in hell, no prospect of the most terrible torture that could move me from my resolution. So, I repeat once more, in spite of all the horrors I have been through since my arrest, I am happy to have stepped forward in defence of the people and to die for the people. It is not just the humiliated and sick Mariah Spiridonova standing here before you. It is the humiliated and sick country of Russia itself. This entire country shudders with pain and horror. Someday we must put an end to this animosity. Come out behind your deliberations with an olive branch, not with a raised sword. Maria Spiridonova, you are guilty of murder. You shall be taken from this court to a place of execution where you'll be hanged by the neck until you're dead. against the monarchy. Within days, Tsar was forced to abdicate. General amnesty was declared and political prisoners were set free among the jubilant crowds. Welcome back, Illich. It's good to have you here. It's great to be back here. I understand that you've had a very difficult journey. Uh, what is a few walls for the cause, Illich? And I hear you had an eventful journey as well. Eventful is exactly the word for it. We were stopped by the police at every border between Moscow and Zurich. The police could have dragged us off the train and shot us out of hand at any one of those. We were terrified that the leadership of the revolution would be beheaded. It was a great achievement for them to get us through safely to Russia. We had some interesting events. Our comrade Radek stopped the train at Stockholm and we were there three hours waiting for him while he went shopping. And you know what he bought? While the revolution waited and held its breath, he bought me a new suit, a pair of boots, and three pairs of underpants. He must think I am the fucking Tsar who would need <laughs> three pairs of underpants. <laughs> but then we were back on the way. Well, it's good to great have you to here. See you. Yeah, it's great to have you here.
my friends, it is the duty of we socialist revolutionaries in this time of embittered struggle to cleanse the moral atmosphere, to reintroduce into our daily lives the spirit of idealism. Our ultimate aim is the furtherance of the human personality. The goal that we are striving for is not merely that people should have enough to eat, that all should have their rightful place in human society. We aim at something more than that. What we strive for is the ennoblement of the human spirit in this material struggle. Feelings of hatred lie deeply entrenched in each one of us that has grown up in these conditions of social inequality that have persisted for so many centuries. Our duty is to control our hatred and convert it into combating the social system. The time has come for us socialist revolutionaries to put our great social duties into effect. You must immediately carry out socialization of the soil. You must carry with you into your work the guiding spirit of truth. Then we shall succeed in filling this somewhat primitive movement with a living spirit of true revolution. It's true that the Bolsheviks have lots of followers today, but that won't last long. It won't last because Bolshevism has no inner inspiration. Everything in it is founded on hatred and bitterness. These feelings, founded on egoism, are intelligible in times of bitter struggle. But the second stage of the struggle will require us to work from foundations of love and altruism, and then the Bolsheviks will show themselves to be bankrupt. There is no doubt that the socialist revolution will soon break forth, but the words on our banner must be love, brotherhood and trust. Under that banner, we are unconquerable. Until recently, we thought that the Constituent Assembly was something revolutionary. But now that we begin to see the true nature of what is happening, parliamentary illusions are dispelled from our minds. It is the people themselves, not parliaments, that will bring about the social release of humanity. The fate of the workers of the world depends on the way that we manage our revolution. So, our peasant congress wishes to put forward this request. Let your first law be the socialization of the land. socialisation of the soil was a big deal for us peasants. The way it used to be was you had the landlord who owned all the land and all of us who worked on it. We were slaves basically. We got rid of that with the revolution. Well that was the idea. We needed to get it in law. So Maria invites us all to Petrograd for this big meeting, the Third Soviet Congress on 10th of January. She got us all together and we wrote the law between us. Must have been about oh, a thousand of us split into 26 committees. We all had a say, like originally it said, all kinds of private property in land or soil are now and forever abolished. But that wasn't good enough for a start, so that became all property is forever abolished. We kept going over it and over it until we all agreed. It took ages, over two weeks, but we ended up with this law where everyone has access to the land and no one owns it. Now we're all allowed to work on as much land as we need to support ourselves and our families. Maria presented it to the Soviet Committee on 27th of January. Lenin and all of that lot wanted to debate it, but we were all like, no debate, just vote, so it got passed. Everyone could see Lenin wasn't keen. When it came to signing it off, you could literally see Maria forcing his hand. We couldn't believe it. We wanted it in writing to take back to our villages, so Maria got loads of copies printed. We couldn't have done it without her. Nice one, Maria.
chief duty is to ensure that the socialisation of the land is carried out. The mentality and the principles of the Bolsheviks are alien to this task, therefore it is down to us to carry it out. How can we do this unless we take part in government? I do not believe that the Bolsheviks have become counter-revolutionaries. They have only brought humiliation on themselves and on the Russian people as well. If they do betray the revolution, no more concessions and compromises. But if they are not traitors, we can honourably cooperate and work with them. We must decide one way or the other. Comrades, I'm going to set out for you the tasks that we, the Soviet government, need to address immediately. Enough damage has already been done. It is now time to restore order and discipline, especially in the economic field. We must increase productivity. Let us look to the United States, where the methods of the engineer Frederick Taylor have created more efficient ways of managing factories. Rubbish! I remember when you dismissed Taylorism as a pseudo-scientific method of sweating more work out of the workers. What's changed? Yes, I did, comrade. But there is much to be learned from it. Bourgeois specialists must be introduced to impose discipline and unity of purpose in the workshops. Mm. How can we achieve this? By getting the masses to submit to the will of a single man. In the history of revolutions, the dictatorship of single individuals has often been the expression of the dictatorship of revolutionary classes. Therefore, there is no inconsistency between socialist democracy and individuals taking dictatorial power over the people. It would be extremely stupid and absurdly utopian to assume that the tradition from capitalism to socialism is possible without coercion and without dictatorship. So I propose state capitalism as the economic system of the Soviet Republic. We will impose iron discipline in the factory and the workshop, with the proletariat working under the leadership of bourgeois or paid specialists. And what are the peasants? We will not involve the peasants. Their petty bourgeois psychology makes them unsuitable for socialism. To sum up then, proletarian dictatorship in the form of party or individual dictatorship must be the foundation of the Soviet state. Unquestioning subordination to a single will is absolutely necessary. To the will of a single person, to the will of the Soviet leader. So the ghost of the feudal master is rising from the grave in the form of our new Soviet masters. These Soviet overlords will rule over us in the factories, on our railways and in our villages, and over all these masters will reign the Soviet state at the highest point of the new hierarchy. Nothing could be more abhorrent. We have work to do. The big job for you is the 5th Congress. What's the pattern of votes as you see it at this point? You're the man with the numbers. Currently, I would say the left SRs are in the lead. Maybe five, ten delegates. That's terrible. If they win by just one vote, they will take us back to war with Germany and we can't allow that. We have to protect the revolution. And the only way to do that is through the peace of Brest-Litovsk. That gives us the breathing space 
to build up our army, to get bread production going, to get distribution of bread back into the cities. It's that essential that we have the majority at the 5th Congress. Where are the extra votes going to come from that are going to give us the majority? Currently, the SRs are recruiting 60,000 a month. We still have a majority in Petrograd and Moscow. We could uh, increase the number of delegates from those cities. What do we have from the peasant Soviets on our side? In a lot of the peasant countries, the SRs are winning, but they're a long way away. It is possible that there'll be travel difficulties. They're very possible. It's always possible for travel to be disrupted. We have many Bolshevik comrades working on the railways. They are disciplined and they know what needs to be done. And the peasants in the army, I think it's fair to say that maybe some of the votes might have been duplicated. And they have been soldiers as well as peasants, so they might well have been counted twice. Exactly. Large numbers of them might have been counted twice. Many, many of them. The chaos of war is a terrible thing. Terrible thing. Terrible thing. And the combat forces are finding new Soviets all the time. Right, we need a hundred of these new Soviets established by tomorrow. I will make, can make you do sure that? that's... Yes, I can. And decree that the number of votes to establish a Soviet is smaller in the urban areas than it is in the rural areas. Jakob, you have my absolute confidence in this matter. Thank you. Have you thought about who's going to chair the session? Trotsky? No, definitely not Trotsky. It would drive Spiridonova right up the wall. She hates him. You should chair it. You have a civil relationship with her. You can speak to her. She would respect you. Make everything look very democratic. She's due to speak as the People's Commissar for Peasants. Just ensure she keeps to a very narrow brief and doesn't roam off into other speakers' territories. If she wanders too far, slap her down. There will be voices in your support from the floor. I will arrange that. I, f I fear that might not be possible. The peasants see her as a saint. If I were to stifle her, there might be more uproar and outcry. She may be regarded as a saint, but within the room, their voices will be with you. I will ensure that. As soon as she's finished speaking, follow her up with Trotsky straight away. Don't let applause go on for too long and make sure that when she comes to speak, she walks up to the platform from the floor of the meeting and not from the platform. You can arrange all this. You've done this stuff before. Sure. You know the techniques. We could emphasize how small a woman she is. And even sometimes hysterical. Your role is calm, control, order and discipline. You make the conference work. People are disruptive. You rise above that to make sure we have a successful revolutionary congress. <laughs> Things ain't so good for us peasants at the moment. The Bolsheviks have started sending in the Red Army to take our grain. We don't have a say in it. We were promised enough land to feed ourselves, but basically now the state owns the land and everything that comes out of it. I've heard they're coming for our spuds next. It all goes to the cities where support for the Bolsheviks is strongest. I mean, we were already supplying the cities through our Soviets, but now they just come and help themselves and we end up going hungry. Lenin calls it produce dictatorship. Yeah, that's about right. It's a dictatorship. We're not much better off than when the Tsar was in charge. But we're not worried. Maria will sort us out.
comrades, the Fifth Congress of the Soviet Government is now in session. Our next speaker is the Commissar for the Peasants section. I, I believe somewhere at the back. Well, comrades, how times have changed. In the six months since the Third Congress, when our two parties stood united in purpose and in optimism. Yeah. Yeah. Now your new regime strengthens its grip with each day that passes and life grows steadily worse for our peasants. Yes. I have seen the results of what the Bolsheviks are doing to the villages where your armed commissars take the food. The freedom of the peasants, their cooperation with the factory workers, the freedom of the Soviets, all of these are threatened yes. by your authoritarian yes. decrees. Well, we were organising peasant communes in the villages the Bolshevik commissars rode in to disrupt them. Mm. So I recently paid the president of the commissars a visit mm. and I asked him to start supporting our communes. Mm. He answered impatiently, how long will you keep quiet if I do support you? So I had to grovel and beg for something that should be a priority of the revolution. And what has your so-called peace with Germany brought us? Mm -hmm. We heard yesterday from our comrade Alexandrov, mm -hmm. from the outlawed Soviet in Ukraine, where the bourgeoisie are back in charge. Yes, yes. Yes. They are supported by German imperialists mm -hmm. who strip steal bread, metal and coal from the revolution yes. and slaughter our peasants by the thousands. Oh, oh, this so-called peace treaty has cost Ukraine its freedom. Yes. Meanwhile, Count Wilhelm Graf von Mehrmann sits in the German embassy, growing fat while a famine rages around him, telling Trotsky what to do, plotting with counter-revolutionaries and communicating with Milyukov in Kiev, where the capitalists and the aristocrats are hiding, planning their return. our demand that the Ukraine Soviet be given a seat at the Congress. Yes, you vote against our demand yes, for delegates from the local no, Soviets yes, to be allowed no, to speak no, here yes. and tell us all about those who have had their throats cut oh, or been yes, stabbed yes. in the back by your decrees. Yes, you true. vote against our demands that we debate your reintroduction of the death penalty, oh, a shameful oh, legacy of Tsardom. Yes, well done. You have proven you can outvote us. <laughs> yes. You may have a majority in the Congress, but you don't have a majority in the country. No, no, no. You want to transform the property of the landlords into state controlled no, economic no, no, no. units, ruled over by your commissars. Yes, by you, by you and your commissars. But the working peasants of Russia understand that this is nothing but a return to slavery. Exactly. You reintroduced the death penalty yes, yes, yes. and made it a state institution. Yes. Worst of all, you've had dealings with state imperialism abroad. Oh, they have tried to. In other words, yes. you betrayed the revolution yes. and the consequences yes. be upon your own head. Comrades, permit me, even though the previous speaker was at times extremely excited, to submit my report on behalf of the Council of People's Commissars in the usual way. That is, to deal with the main questions of principle in order of merit, and not to enter into the argument which the previous speaker would so much like to have had. You know that since the last Congress, the chief factor which has determined our position has been the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. I think that the past three and a half months have demonstrated that, despite all the reproaches that have been thrown at us from certain quarters, that we were right. No, no. I'm not 
I'm quite sort of surprised that the only way they can answer is by shouts, hysterical abuse, outrage and wild behaviour when they have no other argument. Let us remember how they keep changing their position. When the Soviet regime was founded on October the 26th, 1917, when our party and its representatives on the Central Executive Committee invited the left socialist revolutionaries to join us, they refused. They were against us. No dictator. Yes, the truth is hard to swallow, isn't it? Let me remind you that those who do not know themselves what they want and refuse to join us. When the previous speaker had the floor, the vast majority of the delegates did not interrupt her. As you were talking sense. Well, yes. it is only to be expected. If there are people in the left socialist revolution, hey, like the previous speaker, one of the sincerest, and therefore one who is most liable to be carried away, Ooh. most subject to changes of opinion, say that they cannot work with the Bolsheviks Ray, and are quitting. We shall not regret it for an instant. Oh. Comrades, it is false, a thousand times false, to say that we Bolsheviks are engaged in a war against the peasantry. You are yeah, the exterminators. Oh, but in the order to stands. deal with the famine, and we're not your comrades. We have to distribute what grain the peasants produce by taking it from the kulaks without compensation and paying a scale for the poor peasants and a lower scale for the middle peasants. Bread cannot be distributed by decree. Yay. Yes, we promised the peasants socialisation of the you land, did. but that was a concession. Oh. 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 Could not be introduced in a single stroke. That's what you said you agreed to. We know that we may have made a mistake oh. in the socialisation of the land in law. It was a concession to the left socialist revolutionaries who said they would only remain in government if this law were passed. Oh, like that, like that, like that. And Spiridonova is a thousand times wrong no. in bringing forward these unconnected no. facts and saying that she came to see me, humbled herself and implored me. Oh. Comrades, you know me. You know that this is not something that can have happened. That no comrade would have been treated like that. It must be a bad party indeed, whose best and sincerest oh, oh, go to the length of spreading such fairy tales. Oh, 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 oh. I want to say only one thing in Ray. conclusion. Until the new harvest is brought in to the starving localities of Petrograd and Moscow, a hard period of the Russian Revolution lies before us. But there is not a shadow of doubt that if we follow the path which we have chosen firmly and unswervingly, if we do not allow ourselves to be diverted from the right path by any phrase making, illusions, deceit, or hysterics, yeah. mm -hmm. then we have every chance in the world of maintaining our position, Your position and of resolutely not. furthering the victory of socialism in Russia. <laughs> It has been my life's ambition to bring you all together, but together united and not divided as some here would have it. I stand before you as Commissar for the Peasantry, as I stood before you last October when we passed the law on the socialisation of the land, the historic moment when the land was returned to those who live and toil on it. 
It was we socialist revolutionaries who worked day and night to bring such a tremendous change to the Second Congress of Soviets. It was we who persuaded the Bolsheviks to adopt our socialist revolutionary land policy as if it were their own. <laughs> the Bolsheviks call themselves the proletarian party, but they are not because they do not trust the working class. Even in these few months of the socialist revolution, they have sought to disband the factory committees, the very organs of proletarian democracy, which must form the basis of a new society. If even now, in the eye of the revolutionary storm, they attack the workers of Putilov and the sailors of Kronstadt, the very workers they eulogise in their party organs, then what hope for our peasantry? They are men in love with abstract theories and in love with those who are also in love with abstract theories. The peasants are not in love with abstract theories. They toil and starve and die while you decide their fate. We know that Comrade Lenin believes that only the industrial proletariat can make a revolution and that his support for socialisation of the land was merely tactical to bring us socialist revolutionaries into coalition with him. Comrade peasants, he thinks you are dumb to be wiped off his shoes, that you are disposable, tradable, that you have no role to play in history. Yes, to him you are dumb. The Bolsheviks have now reached an accommodation with German imperialism which surrenders millions of our Russian peasants to starvation, slavery and death. We will not support the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk or anyone who does support it. They are betrayers of the revolution. Unless they change, we will have to resort to the pistol and the hand grenade as we did in Tsarist times. This is the International Socialist Revolution! Don't panic. Don't panic. It's just a grenade in the upper circle. Stay calm. It's clear that the Bolsheviks are not going to give way on the Treaty of brest They've had their warning. Blumkin is on his way to see Count von Mirbach. Check up. Come in. Here, Excellency. He says it's urgent. Here is his credentials signed by Dzerzhinsky. Mm -hmm. yeah, you better show him in then. Mm -hmm. Delete. Delete. Ah, and what's your name? Bloomkin, sir. I've been sent by the All Russian Extraordinary Commission to combat counter revolution. And what's so urgent that you couldn't make an appointment? We believe there is to be an imminent attempt on your life, sir. On my life? Who would do such a thing? Me. the Telegraph, Zhezinsky, and therefore the Cheka. We need only seize the Bolshoi, the Kremlin, and the Third Revolution can begin. The Bolsheviks have no fighters. Hey! Have we had any communication from Lenin? None. Hands in the air and a return to Zurich. Satisfactory for me. If we storm the Bolshoi, there will be many deaths on all sides. Left communists and... We didn't want this, Maria. But the Bolsheviks robbed us of our rightful majority. Millions will die. They wish to kill our peasants. 
But they must see the futility of continuing. Look, it's hard enough to get our soldiers motivated to fight the Bolsheviks. Many are confused. I can't get them to kill fellow socialists with a half-hearted appeal. We decided to fight by majority. We must see it through. Those who make half a revolution dig their own graves, and that's still a possibility for all of us. Now, I've got some work to do in Odessa. The Red Army is here and the left SRs are under arrest. Tell Lennon I'll meet him at the Kremlin. Spirit Donova, the court is waiting for you. I will not recognize the authority of that court, but you can take a message from me. Let Lenin and the Bolsheviks hear this. Never in the most corrupt of parliaments, never in the most venal papers of capitalist society has hatred of opponents reached such heights of cynicism as your hatred. Your party began its work well. The October Revolution in which we marched side by side was bound to succeed because we were solidly supported by all the working class. But your policies went on to betray the working class. Instead of the socialization of industry, you introduced state capitalism, a capitalist state. So we still have a system of coercive exploitation where your countless officials will devour even more than the limited numbers of the bourgeoisie ever could. Remember the Third Soviet Congress when the socialization of the soil was decreed with universal rejoicing. Instead, what you have offered the peasants, with a mixture of force and cunning, is the nationalisation of the soil. Now, factory workers, in order not to die of starvation, march against peasants and take away their last piece of bread. Terrible seeds of dissension have been sown between these two groups who used to be inseparable. And then there is your checker, which has wiped out all the moral achievements of our revolution. It is torture and treachery and murder, murder without end. Since Lenin was shot by our sister Dora, overnight thousands of people have been condemned to death. People are killed, left, right and centre, without the faintest shadow of justification, to say nothing of morality. Oh, well done, Lenin is saved. No one will try and shoot him again. But in your catacomb of sacrifices, you have abandoned the living spirit of the revolution. Did it not occur to you, Vladimir Ilyich, with your great intelligence and your personal disinterestedness to show Dora Kaplan some mercy? But no, in this era of fear and hatred, not a single accent or sound of love is heard. Belief in socialism is a belief in a noble future for humanity, a belief in goodness, truth and beauty, in the abolition of force in all its forms, in the brotherhood of the world. And now you have damaged this belief to its very roots. Yes, you have helped to give the people a little justice, but you have taken monstrous power upon yourselves and assumed absolute authority over the bodies and souls of the workers. And when the people began to reject you, you put them in chains and called them counter-revolutionary. And now you put on trial the left socialist revolutionaries and you want me in the dock but I reject your jurisdiction. You are not fit to judge our ideas. I submit myself to the judgment of the international and the verdict of history. 
So I will take no part in your staged farce of a trial. You can only eliminate me and my party from the revolution by killing us. I was eager to visit Maria Spiridonova, of whose condition I had heard many conflicting stories. She was living illegally in disguise as a peasant woman after having escaped from the prison in the Kremlin. Arrangements were made to enable me to visit her and I was cautioned to make sure that I was not followed by agents of the Cheka. We agreed with Maria's friend upon a meeting place and from there we zigzagged a number of streets till at last we reached the top floor of the house in the back of the yard. Maria. Emma. <laughs> this then was one of Russia's great martyrs. This woman had so unflinchingly suffered the tortures inflicted upon her by the Tsar's henchmen. Louise Bryant had told me Maria Spiridonova has the greatest political following of any woman in the world. I thought this must be an overstatement. But now in the circumstances of revolutionary Russia, it might well be true that this tiny understated woman might indeed have the greatest political following of any woman in the world. She had escaped from the Kremlin and was living clandestinely while trying to reorganise her party. But her clandestine door was continually knocked as peasants arrived asking for her help. Scraps of paper piled high, each with a story which only Marushka could solve. All addressed her as Marushka, or dear comrade. I was anxious to hear her views of women in politics. You'll think me a feminist, she replied, before taking my hand again. Women were certainly equally represented among exiled revolutionaries and those in prison and those who had committed assassinations. Martyrdom came easily to women because it was instinctive rather than learned. On the other hand, when men become politicians, they are elected to do so, not because they were suited to the work. Women couldn't do that. I think women are more conscientious, she said. Men are used to overlooking their consciences. Women are not. In our three days together, Maria said not a word about herself, her persecution or her illness. Her mainsprings poured into the vast human sea. I felt each ripple rushing back to her all-embracing heart.